I'm going to talk to you today about LARP safety. And LARP safety is an expression that is used very broadly in the LARP community to mean all kinds of things. And that's actually, there's a little challenge there, and most of my talk is going to be about that, because of course when you say safety, immediately people think danger. Oh, so we have to make things safe. That means that they are otherwise dangerous. And yes, some things are dangerous. But many things are also not dangerous, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So this headline is safety and calibration in LARP. Safety is about avoiding things that are dangerous or preventing things that are dangerous. Calibration is about the things that are not dangerous, but that can be intense, for instance. I'm going to talk today about what those things are. Uh, I realized I made one of these headlines that you're supposed to have at the be beginning of your talk, what I'm going to talk about today, but you haven't heard any of the explanations for any of these words yet, so don't, don't read it. You don't know what it means, many of you anyway. Um, I'm going to speak for like 55 minutes about the first four, and then if we have time, I'll go into the last two. And I promise you right now that you can have all of the slides after. And there is a lot of text on the slides, and that's because all of the talk is on the slides, so that you don't have to take notes. You can just listen and think. And also because I used a lot of special, special terms, and it's useful to have the language somewhere afterwards, and we have so many language backgrounds in this room. OK, and remember this. Before we start, I would like to talk a little bit about this guy, King Gustav III of Sweden. This man was not a LARPer, he was a king uh, in the 18th century. He was a king who was very excited about experimental, uh, experimental uh, entertainment. And he actually died in the middle of, middle of an entertainment. Very famously, he got murdered, assassinated at a masked ball. There's an opera written about this. But while he was alive, I've been told, he used to stage these sort of castle entertainments or pageants for himself, like small plays where he got to play the main character because he was the king. So for instance, they would, for one night, they could build elaborate sets, uh, often out of papier-mâché, they would build like an older castle on his castle run, and a papier-mâché dragon that he could fight with a sword and so on. And there is a story that is probably not true, but I'm just telling it anyway. There is a story that I have chosen to believe, that once he fought a dragon in one of his own little LARPs, and there were two actors inside the, the, the dragon, and unfortunately he stabbed one of them when he uh, pierced the side of the, so of the dragon with his sword. And the lesson of this is, when you make LARP, sometimes you stab a peasant. <laughs> and so, so the, this is the game design lesson of King Gustav III is that you have all of these ideas that seem really cool in your mind, but then when you actually you know, make them happen in the real world, LARP is about action, about people doing things, and unpredictable things, and freedom, and then you don't always know what the consequences will be. And if you think of your participants as peasants, you have a real problem. In fact, I think the twofold lesson uh, of King uh, Gustav is this, and now blue star on the, on the slide means extra important. So when you make a LARP, you make the rules, but you don't actually get to be the king or the, or the hero. You are the artist, but you are the artist who is a servant of the experience of your participants. So the second lesson is if, if, you, want to, if you want to be the king or the hero, you should go play other people's LARPs. Okay. So your job as the LARP designer is to make your players be safe and feel safe to explore and enjoy your game. Be safe, don't get stabbed. Feel safe, feel like they can play. So is LARP dangerous? No. But life is dangerous. The world is dangerous. And everything that is dangerous in the real world is also dangerous in your LARP. Fire is dangerous. Bears are dangerous. Stabbing people with swords is dangerous. Moving around in darkness is dangerous. One of the injuries at Delirium was somebody who decided to jump off a stage in the darkness and forgot exactly how, how high it was. Not very high, but you only have to be off by about 10 centimeters to break your foot. Now, all of those kinds of things, as an organizer, as a LARP designer, you have to think about in advance and account for and try to avoid. You are responsible. You are the host. And common sense, and also in many places, the law, requires you to try to design against these dangers. Now, LARP designers are very busy thinking about what happens during the runtime of the LARP itself. That means during the period when we play the characters in the LARP. And that's what we're going to talk about most of this week. But in actual fact, when you make a LARP, an event, whether you make it in a black box or whether you make it with 400 people in, in, in outdoors, um, 
you are doing many kinds of things. One of the things you're doing is experience design. And experience design is the discipline of designing an experience where you gather people in a, in a place and they experience something together. So if you organize a party, that's experience design. If you organize a summer school, that's experience design. And then on top of the experience design level, as, game, as LARP designers, we add the LARP design level where you put some role play in and you put some fiction in. And we have to think about the role play and the fiction, and we will for a big part of this talk. But before you do that, you have to think about all of the things that you would think of if the thing that you were making was a convention or a party. So fire safety, for instance, is equally important whether or not there is fiction uh, present. Um, there is also a third level that I won't have time to talk so much about today, and that's community design. And that means, how do you encourage your participants or your wider LARP community or the communities that you belong to in other places? How do, you, how do, how are they, how do they um, interact with each other in general? So if people are super mean to each other, for instance, and then those people who are very mean to each other go, go and play a LARP, they will probably also be mean to each other in the, in the LARP, or maybe they won't trust each other very much, and that's going to create problems for you as a designer. So you have to think about how the community are, are operating and how they design. And because I don't have time to talk about it, what we can do is that you can, I will give you homework. I'm not going to ask you about this, but you can talk to each other. Your homework is to think, this summer school, this week, we are designing a community because all of us are doing this experience together and we want all of us to be part of the summer school community and the alumni community in the future. What are the tools that we are using to make this feel like a community? How have we established rules here together? How are you feeling invited or not invited to engage with the community? Okay. So back to physical safety, let's start with some of the obvious things. To live, humans need oxygen, water, food, and basic hygiene. They need somewhere to take shelter from the weather, and they need somewhere to take a crap. If these things are not in place in your event, you are a jerk, possibly also breaking the law. But the most important thing for you as a LARP designer, as an artist, is that people who are hungry or super uncomfortable can't actually be creative. That's just the way biology works. So this stuff needs to be in place first. Second, people have different backgrounds, so they have different expectations and they are prepared in different ways for environments. If you make a LARP, in Norway in the winter, the environmental demands will be very different than if you make a LARP in Palestine in the summer. And your local people will know what those requirements are, and nobody else will. And sometimes, if you're from a city and you're going into the country or vice versa, you also won't know what the requirements are. And somebody has to tell your participants, and that somebody is you. Prepare your players. Third, LARP fictions tend to include dangerous themes or elements such as violence or action, alcohol perhaps is served, and there are accident-prone situations of all kinds, like people pretending to be very agitated. But really what is most dangerous when you gather people in one place is uh, illnesses, like people getting a stomach flu because they don't wash their hands, to, hands well. That's actually the, the real, the, the major sort of safety risk. So that you have to design against that. People have to be able to wash their hands. Four. The real world may not know that you are playing. Just a very sort of practical example. Bjarke, who's sitting in the back, was playing uh, a vampire LARP, I think, in Copenhagen in the, is it the 90s? No, it's even in, after the millennium, where they were using very real-looking gun props. They were inside in a closed-off yard. Now, unfortunately, there were some houses with apartments facing this yard. So, of course, somebody called the police on them. So when the police came into the yard, they came in with real guns. And to all of these people who are trying to just pretend executing somebody with the pretend gun. This could have ended really, really, really badly. Now, luckily, it didn't end badly, but the real world is present around your LARP, and that doesn't stop existing just because you and your participants step into a fiction. So you have to think about that. Traffic is another typical example. So the most common safety element, therefore, in LARP uh, is simulation. Instead of doing the thing that is dangerous, you do something that looks pretty similar or, or gives a similar feeling, but is actually not dangerous. 
For instance, you take the real guns away, because you don't want to shoot people, and then you give them toy guns. You give them cold tea instead of whiskey, perhaps, if you don't want them to be drunk. You fight in slow motion instead of, of, of for real, or you don't fight at all, and you do some other kinds of ritual interactions to determine who wins in a conflict. Um, Obviously, some fictions include, for instance, supernatural events like flying or invisibility, which are very difficult to, for real humans to do. And then that also needs to be represented somehow inside the fiction. And physical intimacy, uh, so kissing, for instance, or sex, is on this slide also, not because those things are dangerous, but because it in they involve the body and they involve a lot of biological or otherwise strong urges and uh, personal boundaries and limits, which are not the same for, for different people. Uh, and, and they need to be negotiated. And the common way of negotiating them is that we, we decide that we replace those with other things in the game. However, as we learned from the story of Copenhagen and the guns, the simulation itself can cause danger. Every time you make a design choice anywhere in your LARP, it has consequences in other places, and it might have consequences on your safety. For instance, you want your LARP to look very cool, so you decide not to use the multicolored water guns that look like toys, but you decide to use the BB guns that look like real guns. That is an aesthetic decision, but it has safety consequences. Do you understand? And I'm not saying that it's wrong to use the real gun, but then you have to have a way to make sure that nobody calls the police on you. Then you have to think of wh where do we play this game, for instance. Also, pyrotechnics and special effects are another uh, example where you can, pr you can put in something that is safer or more real possible than the real thing, because people, real humans, don't throw fireballs very well. And then you can actually introduce new dangers into your fiction by the thing that is your replacement. The human brain develops uh, in, uh, iteratively. <laughs> we, we developed through evolution. Before we were smart, we were stupid. And that stupid little brain is still there at the core of our brain. Like We're still cal carrying that little hamster around. And the little hamster is not super intelligent, but it's very, very fast. The hamster gets scared fast. It reacts fast. It wants to fight. It wants to flee. It wants to have sex. Uh, and this means that, I mean, this is one of the reasons that we put in simulation so that when things get intense, people don't act actually punch each other because we have uh, another system in, in place. Even when my, I, my, I might feel real adrenaline because my character might be really agitated or I might get really scared in this horror game. But of course, we don't want people to actually hurt themselves or hurt each other, so we put in these replacements instead. But it's good to know that those instincts are still there. Like if you're going to have a horror scenario and somebody's going to jump out and scare people, they might get punched in the face. Because that's not a rational, like that's not an aware decision. The player is a human body that will react faster than they have time to think, and that's a good thing to have uh, there. I think, like, what do we do about this if we want to have fighting in the game? I think a good thing is always eyes on the fight, always have, uh, always have uh, some kind of, of organizer presence or somebody who is not involved in a conflict look at the conflict from the outside so that they can break. If you absolutely want to have these kinds of very physical fighting styles, for instance. Maybe you should make another choice. You should read this slide. This is Blue Star slide, one of the most dangerous things in LARP ever. You don't design for it, because of course you don't decide. Often you don't decide that your players are not going to sleep. However, your players are very often not going to sleep. If you make a multi-day event where interesting things happen during the night, they will want to play those things instead of sleep. If you make a short LARP at a convention or at a summer school, again, maybe the people who are participating will not be sleeping, or they will be sleeping a little bit too little every night. And on like day five, they will be quite tired, as you will find out if you don't sleep. Sleeping is important because lack of sleep makes us make bad decisions. It makes it very difficult to concentrate, which is a requirement for role playing. It makes us stupid. It can, makes us halluc it can create hallucinatory states if you really don't sleep for a long time. And it takes a long time to come back from lack of sleep, which will make you feel bad after, which will make your participants feel bad after your LARP. And then they will blame your LARP when actually it's their own fault because they hadn't, haven't slept. But maybe you could have encouraged them to sleep and that they would have liked your, your LARP better. And also, lack of sleep makes people emotional and sad. Now, we heard about Capo, which was a LARP with a lot of physical pressure. So yes, of course, you can make the choice to use physical pressure as a tool. 
hunger, coldness or chill, dirt, lack of sleep. This can be a valid part of the LARP. You can have this in your design toolkit. Good things to remember is that very slight pressure can easily simulate strong pressure, especially for, for people who, have, who normally have pretty comfortable lives. If they're just a little hungry, they're going to think that they're starving. They're not actually starving. However, this must be an active choice by you as a designer. So don't let your, don't starve your players through incompetence. Like don't forget to buy water. Like if you have forgotten to buy water, you have to stop the, to cancel your LARP and go buy water, and then maybe you know you can play. Uh, everybody has to make an active choice, but also the participants have to make an active choice. They have to know in advance that they're going to a thing that is going to expose them to cold and torture and, and lack of food. And I don't want everything to be safe and cuddly. That's not my point at all, even though I'm a total safety Nazi. I, am, I care about these things because I want it to be possible for LARP makers to make games like Capo and make them playable and make them also safe, or at least safe enough so that the players can take an aware risk. And say, it's a little risky. I might fall, I might slip in the wet dark and actually hurt myself, but I'm going to take that risk because I want that experience. Players do need to be informed before they sign up, before they commit, before they give you money, if there's money involved, about any unexpected design choices that you have. So if you're going to feed them only nuts, that might kill some people. If you, put, if you make a LARP where the scenography is 800 kilos of flour, like you would use to bake bread, real example, asthmatics cannot play that game because the, the dust will, might kill them. And it, this is a valid design choice. You can make games that are not accessible for all people, but you have to tell them in advance so that they don't invest in your game, in your LARP, sorry, before, um, before being exposed to this. Not every human can climb a mountain. So if you want to make a mountain climbing LARP, you have to tell them in advance. It sounds pretty obvious, but you would be surprised how many people think that cool surprises are cool. Surprises are almost never cool. And if there are surprises like this, what will happen is something called rage quitting, which is that your participants show up to your thing, they look at your mountain, and they say, and then they go home. And then they tell everyone on the internet that you're an idiot. And that is, you know, also true. So it's completely fair. OK. I would ask you now all to close your eyes and think about the following question. You have all LARPed today, or most of you at least have LARPed today. And think about these questions. And if, you, if the answer is yes, please raise your hand, but keep your eyes closed so that nobody except me can see the answers. Was it easy to LARP today? OK. Was it hard or challenging to LARP today? OK. Did you feel emotions while you were LARPing that had to do with the characters or the fiction while you were LARPing today? OK. Did you feel any kind of strong emotion? Maybe you personally, as a player, not as the character, felt a strong emotion during the LARP. Or maybe your character felt a strong emotion during the LARP. Any kind of strong emotion during the LARP? OK. OK, and you can put your hands down, and you can open your eyes. Thank you. So let's think a little bit about what role playing is. Role playing is stepping into a new environment, a physically new environment often, and also a new social environment. It's acting as somebody else. It's entering relationships that are temporary. Uh, and it's asking very often, like here, grown-ups or teenagers, well, here we're all grown-ups, but it's all asking grown-ups to play. And in our culture, it's quite often considered a little bit embarrassing for grown-ups to play. Now, many of you found it hard to play today, and I just want to say, immediately that that is completely OK and totally normal. And that does not reflect on whether you have LARPing experience or not. Sometimes LARPing, very often actually, LARPing is super difficult. And sometimes it feel, um, feels embarrassing or weird. Sometimes it even feels embarrassing or weird, while it also feels fantastic and you're having an interesting experience with the fiction. These are completely normal experiences. My definition of role playing, and there's so many, but my definition of role playing for the purposes of this talk is this. Characters acting in fictional situations with interesting emotions and fictional social relationships. So interesting emotions could be things like love, boredom, uh, anger, fear, shame, curiosity, excitement. And when you feel those feelings during the LARP, 
it's very difficult to say, are these feelings fictional or not? It's your body. I mean, emotions are physically pr produced in the body. So if your character is feeling them, if you experience your character feeling them, then you are also feeling them. These are, in a way, real emotions. They just have much fewer consequences than the same emotion would have somehow, somehow, somehow outside the fiction. The human body, in fact, does not understand fiction. That's a good safety baseline to, to keep in mind. And then we have these fictional social relationships that can happen, that can manifest very fast in a LARP, even in a very short one like you play today. Family, status, comradeship, trust, loyalty, love. And during the play, when we're treating each other as though these relationships are real, they are real because that's how social environments work. Of course, they're temporary. The moment we stop playing, they are no longer real. This is a kind of social magic, which is what makes role playing, all kinds of role playing, including LARPing, so powerful. But it also makes it difficult. So what role playing requires is trusting people, connecting with people, trying new actions and situations. And we all know that trying new things for most of us is terrifying, like no matter where we are. And engaging with new rules and engaging with ideas and creating things together, all of these are terrifying things. So when you LARP, sometimes this, all of this feels automatic. And it, but even when it feels automatic, this is what is actually required. And they can feel new, hard to do, embarrassing, confuse, confusing. And people who are embarrassed or confused, they close up a little bit, they get a little bit defensive, we all do. And we, if we want to play together, we need to be curious and trusting and attentive and generous with our impulses. And on top of this, as though that wasn't enough, role playing very often involves feeling all these strong emotions. And they can be unexpected. Because we're just playing, so it shouldn't feel this, this shouldn't feel so powerful, right? It's weird that I feel all of these feelings. And that can feel dangerous or shocking. Now, it's not dangerous or shocking. It's powerful. LARP is powerful. LARP is not dangerous. All of these emotions and all of these social risks that we're taking to engage with each, with each other, they are not dangerous, but they are difficult. And they do require design. So a, a well-made LARP is like a machine that allows the participants to overcome all of these worries that we all carry with us and enter a place where we can play together and create something together and experience strong emotions together and feel that that's OK and interesting. And those things are particular to LARP. That's why it's powerful. That's not dangerous. So what we're talking about in LARP safety is being safe from harm, so dangers, LARP safety, but also feeling safe to play which is not about dangers. That's about trust and what we can call social safety, so feeling with each other that it's OK to do this thing, and play style calibration. How do I want to play? How do you want to play? Do you actually want me to punch you in the face right now? How can we make that sure while we're playing? Have we agreed that face, faces will be punched? And if we have agreed, do you still want me to punch you in the face? Do I still want you to punch me in the face? I don't think there will be any face punching this week, by the way. You can all relax. But it's possible to design for face punching if you do it systematically. So being safe, the object of your design is safety. Feeling safe, then the object of your design is participation. OK. How do we make it feel that LARPing is a normal thing to do. That's the design challenge here. LARPing is a normal thing to do, but it feels unnormal. I've been LARPing for over 20 years, and I dread it every time when I want have to LARP. I feel like, oh, why am I doing this? And every time once I'm actually LARPing, I love it. So weird. Then the machine has been well designed. But it would be even nicer if I could feel even before it starts that it's not going to be terrifying. So there's something called the role play contract. To be able to pray, and, and this is how it works sort of on a general level. To be able to play, we promise not to judge the player based on the character and not to judge the character based on the player. And we agree that the actions in game, as it's traditionally known, like in, while, while we are playing, the, the actions inside the LARP will not have the consequences that they would off game, so outside the LARP. Uh, and because this is the agreement, this is the baseline agreement, this is what LARPing is, and therefore it isn't embarrassing. Therefore, it's something that we can do together. It's a prerequisite for all role-playing. But 
As we know now from the exercise we did before, or you don't all know, but I'm telling you now, many of you learned today that this isn't actually true. It's very difficult to trust that this will happen, and once while we are playing, we might be worried anyway. We behave as though the role play agreement, the role play contract is true to be able to play, but it is actually also not true. Emotions and experiences travel inside the, into the games and out of the games because the player and the character have the same body. This is not a problem, this is good. This is what makes role playing possible. This is why it's possible for us to have these interesting experiences. However, it also means that sometimes all of our social worries come into and out of the game. And we have to have this agreement, and we have to have in our community as the culture where we say social punishment for fictional situation is not okay. And we have a culture where we don't mock each other for the choices that their characters make, for instance. We celebrate them, we say that was an interesting choice you made. But if you feel feelings while you LARP that feel like inappropriate, that's actually completely normal. When emotions travel into or out of the game, accidentally or on purpose, so like in the dream game, for instance, players were invited to bring a lot of stuff from their real life into the fiction. Um, this is called bleed. Sounds very dramatic. Nobody's bleeding. It's all in our minds. It's called bleed if it's positive, and it's called bleed if it's negative. And bleed is not harmful, but bleeds, the effects of bleed are unpredictable. So you can have a strong emotional reaction to a LARP, and maybe you would go to a game, to a LARP like Capo and think, oh, well, it's about torture, and it's going to be terrible, and it's going to be about oppression, and you expect to have a terrible time. But maybe it's a very well-designed machine, safety machine, and actually, while you're in there, it feels like you're okay. You can leave if you need to, so you don't need to leave, and you're fine. Then maybe you will, you will play something like Family Anderson, and maybe some of you become really sad and moved because you're suddenly reminded of a conflict in your, in your own family, in the real world. It's very unpredictable. And it's not necessarily the strong themes that give the strong reactions. Even the funny, huggable, bumby bears LARP could give a very strong emotional reaction. And you just don't know before it happens, so you have to be prepared for that being possible to happen. Many LARPs are designed to produce strong emotions. And there is no need to protect players from strong emotions, but you do need to acknowledge them when they happen and reflect upon them after they have happened. And if the goal is to give strong emotions, by God, tell the players beforehand that that's the point, so that they know what they're getting into. It might not be possible to make a strong uh, LARP like Capo where no one has a rough reaction. It might be worth it if your theme is something like, like oppression, that some people will actually be, well, Oliver used the word traumatized, I think that's a little strong, but, but some people will go very far to the, close to their limits or beyond their own limits even. That it's possible that that's inevitable, and it might be worth it if you have a political goal, for instance if you're very open about what the goal is. If you want to make a LARP that's just about you being an awesome artist, and you think that it's okay that some people get hurt in the process, then you're not an awesome artist, then you're just a great asshole. Okay. So we have to consider why are we doing this thing. The most common emotional reaction after a LARP, any kind of LARP, is sadness. And people get sad at LARPs for many reasons. Again, not because it's dangerous, but these are some of them. They might feel grief because they have just been part of a fictional community and that was very interesting and amazing. And now that ex uh, community is gone, they might, feel, um, they might feel sad that they were part of a magical world and then the LARP ends and they have to go home and they have to go to school or to their boring office and they can't do magic anymore. And they don't have a meaningful battle against darkness to fight on Monday. And they might feel really sad about that and that is something to be sad about, but that's some, the problem with the real world. That's not actually a problem with, with the LARP. The LARP might be about terrible things that happen in the world, like, like Capo, which is about thematically about things that do happen in the real world all the time, and you might exit that LARP and feel very strongly, oh my God, people are going through this all the time. The world is a terrible place, and you might feel sad about that, and maybe powerless as well for, at first. And that's a good reaction 
because the world is a terrible place. And that was the point of that LARP, to remind you that people are in these situations all the time. Then the question is, it's, I think it's good if the LARP makers give you some tools or directions to take those emotions and, and in direct them at something, something constructive that you can do to make the world better. And of course, we all get perspective on our real life and uh, will to change because we've just taken a, a vacation from our real life. We don't think about it a little bit. So if you come out of a LARP and you feel that you want to change your job and, and divorce your husband, um, I usually, my advice would be like, wait a week and see if you still feel like that. But it might actually be that you are super unhappy in your real life and then you come out and have this reaction. However, if one of your players in one of your LARP has a reaction like that, both they and their husband might feel that it's your fault. Again, it's not your fault, but it's good to be mentally prepared for the fact that taking a break from your real life does give you perspective. That's just how it works. Um, yes. So, how can we learn about this stuff? Well, we can learn about it through playing LARPs. So that's what we're doing this week. And what we need to know, everything I've said so far basically, is that people have very individual reactions to different kinds of LARPs. So it's important that we share, and it's important during this week, that when you play LARPs and you have different reactions, you share them with each other, not just in the debriefs, which have relatively little time, but also over lunch, like how did it feel, how did this? And if, of course, don't tell people stuff that feels too personal or weird, but we've tried to, to I mean, you're always allowed, always allowed here to not participate in, in anything, including conversations. But f to learn LARP design, it's one of the best things you can do is say, what did I experience and why was that different from what you experienced? Even though we played the exact same LARP with the exact same rules in, at the exact same run often. There are no wrong reactions to a LARP. Like whatever the LARP produces in the participant, that's what it produces in the participant. But there is bad design, or there are bad choices when you run the LARP that can give worse outcomes. Maybe you can talk to each other about the family Anderson experience. Maybe some groups had a, had a very fun, Thing, and some had a very sad thing, and some had a thing that felt very awkward all the way through. Talk to each other. Why do you think that was? What was different between the different ones? Yes. So rules or objects that can help participants feel safe to play are very often called alibi. And the alibi is a social sign or agreement between the participants or between the LARP and the world that we're not in the normal space right now. Other rules apply, other behaviors are acceptable. For instance, if I'm playing a queen, I can order people around, something that is not acceptable in the everyday world, because that would make me a bitch. But in the context of the fiction, we all agree that that's a normal thing for us to do. And maybe I wear a crown so that it becomes super clear for everybody, and then I have multiple layers of alibi, and these can be designed. So in this fiction where I'm the queen, there's a magic circle, that's the limit of the LARP, the time and the place when the LARP is being played. The fact that we're playing already gives us alibi, because when you're playing, it doesn't count, right, in our culture. And it's fiction, and we're playing characters, and those aren't real, so that gives me alibi to behave like somebody else. And I wear the special costume or the silly hat, and those give me alibi. And maybe somebody comes in and gives me an instruction, like Eric did before when we waited for the opening, when he said, I will now give you alibi to speak to strangers. You must speak to strangers. And because he was in a position of authority and a very tall man with a deep voice, we all stood up and spoke to strangers which I, as a Finn, would normally never, ever do, ever. But he gave me the alibi to do that. In fact, he gave me an instruction, which can be one way of designing alibi. But darkness can give alibi, or a very short sofa can give us the alibi to sit very close together. This could be anything. So it's about starting to think in this way. What can allow your participants in your LARP to behave in the way that you want them to behave? How do you design the alibi that allows them to play your LARP? Playing together does not have to be fun, as we learned from the Capo example, but it does require consent. That means an agreement to do this thing together. LARP should be mutually between the two participants in a situation, or all participants in a situation, all the participants in the whole LARP, uh, mutually voluntary and continuously voluntary. And this is why we design calibration tools. Because actually, maybe I think that I can play capo. 
and I go in there, and I maybe I, they have this tool where they allow me to choose how intense do I want this to be. Not very intense, I don't like physical pressure. Da, da, da. And then I go in there, and it's not very intense physically, for instance. But then I see that it's much, it's harder than I thought. And maybe I want to make sure that in this thing, like right now, I want to play the LARP, but I don't want you to yell at me right now because right now I can't take it. Wouldn't it be useful for me to have another option instead of just leaving the LARP, which I totally can, that's allowed. It would be great if I can calibrate a little bit between us. And we have a lot of rule systems and tools that can be used in LARP to regulate play intensity in the situation in different ways between the participants. So, to recap what we've sp talk, spoken about so far. You as an organizer of any event have a responsibility for your participants to avoid unnecessary risks and make sure that your participants are super aware of the risks in your design that cannot be avoided. Being safe. And this is true for any experience that you make. But then if it's a LARP and requires participation and co-creation, then you have the additional design challenge that you need to give your, your participants alibi so that they can feel safe to play. And then while they are playing, they need to be able continuously to check in on each other about to keep up that trust uh, and negotiate. Yes, it says here, look at the time. So I'm doing that now, okay. So for the last time, for the time we have left, I'm going to talk a little bit about a, um, a way of thinking of designing safety systems and calibration systems. Uh, that's a sort of structure that you can apply. And I think especially if you're relatively new to this, this is a good baseline to begin with. If you are very experienced, you have made and played a lot of LARPs together with some so the same group of people, for that group of people, you can make things that are not this super safe, if you all agree to it. I don't recommend it, but you absolutely can. <laughs> but this is a good baseline to begin with. So, designing alibi is one tool to enable participation, and then we have to, this idea of opting in and opting out, opt is like option, it means making a choice. I'm choosing to be in, or I'm choosing to remove myself from the situation. This is about giving your participant, participants power to be responsible for their own experience. You empower them to opt in and opt out. So first, opting in is actively choosing to participate in something like a LARP or in a specific situation during the LARP. And to be able to choose, to actively choose to participate, of course, I as a player have to have some idea of what's going to happen in this LARP or in this situation. Informed consent requires information. And we need to take special care when we are designing for beginners or for children, or if we are designing LARPs in environments where people who are also not playing are there. And why is this? Because they can't give informed consent. The thing is, it's really difficult to describe for somebody who hasn't done it how LARP feels. LARP is powerful. If you've done it, you know it, or, or you will know it, I think, by the end of the week. But why it's powerful is very, very difficult to verbalize. And even if you explain it to somebody, they're not really going to believe you. They're going to have a powerful experience, positive or negative, usually positive. And then they're going to be like, this is amazing. Why didn't you tell me? And then you'll be like, I've been telling you for 12 years. And now you finally try it. I've, and they're like, yeah, but I, I, didn't, I didn't believe you. Yeah, no, no. But that means that it's very difficult to communicate to people what kinds of choices they're actually making when they're choosing to, choosing to participate. Even simple LARPs can give very powerful experiences. And one thing that can help and especially if you're doing something intense, is to have transparency in your design. We're repeating these words all the time. Transparency means everything, as much information as possible is available to the players in advance so they know what kinds of things will happen. And sometimes they will also know specifically what will happen. You can make that choice. If you cannot communicate with 100% clarity the kinds of experiences that the players will have, then opting into the LARP, deciding only to participate, is not enough. 
And you cannot, as we know, you cannot communicate with 100% clarity the kinds of experiences that will happen. And one of the reasons for that, another reason for that, is that LARPs are creative, created by the participants in part. So there is emergent content, as it's technically called. It means that players are inventing things that you might not have predicted. And so you can't warn about it in advance because it's brought into the LARP by your participants. So that for this reason, players must be able to continuously opt in or to decide at some point to say, well, that was my limit. I'm opting out or I'm opting in out of this thing specifically. So opting out then is the opposite. Choosing not to participate in something that is about to start or is already happening. And to have the possibility to not participate in something requires to be able to see it coming. So if you are making a LARP about vampires and it's possible to decide not to be bitten, then you also have to have a rule that you can't sneak up on people from, the, from behind and bite them in the neck because then I don't have the opportunity to decide to not be bitten by that person. This is unfortunately uh, a system that I designed that was broken because I had forgotten that it is also possible to approach people from behind. Sometimes, you know, we forget obvious things. And this is why it's very important when you design something to ask a friend to look at it and tell you all the obvious things that you have forgotten. So to be able to opt out, you have to have some, some kind of tool for the players to calibrate opt out. And you also need to be able to sort of show them. And that tool needs to be appropriate for the kinds of things that can happen in that particular LARP. So some of the kinds of the ways of opting out that are possible are to steer the direction of the play. That means that you, in character, you make some choices that, about what kinds of things might happen next. You can pause the play, or you can leave the situation, or you can leave the whole game. And it's very important that it's possible to do these things without fear of social punishment. So if you were really bored in the middle of Family Anderson, I think it would have been quite difficult for you to say, you know what, guys, I'm out of here, and stop playing and leave. I think it's important if you have, I mean, it's a pretty short game, so I think it's acceptable that you didn't feel maybe that you had that, that choice. But if you make a long game or an intense, in a long LARP or an intense LARP, it is important that people have the opportunity to leave and that that doesn't break the LARP for everybody else, because if it does, then it's super difficult to leave because you don't want to ruin it for your, friend, for your friends. When you're a child and you play, you know, like, oh, this isn't fun anymore. You're mean, and then you run off, and it's fine. But LARPs aren't always fun, so you can't measure your experience on am I having fun now? Because often that couple, like 100% of the time, the answer will be no, I'm not having fun. So should I stay or should I go? A better question to ask yourself as a player is, is this meaningful? Is this experience meaningful for me? And if it does not feel meaningful, or if it feels only a little meaningful but very hard, uh, or not at all fun and interesting, then it should be possible for your participants, for you as a player, if you're playing, to step out of play. So your job as a LARP maker, and this is where this gets really interesting, is to design a social agreement and a social space between the players, not the characters, between the players, where they feel that it's always OK to take care of themselves and to take care of, them, of each other. Players are more important than LARPs. Like, LARPs are super important. I have dedicated my life to this form. <laughs> I love LARPs. LARP is art. LARP is life. But players are humans, and humans are more important than art, actually. Um, now, because, as I mentioned, sometimes you can use one method, and then you realize in the LARP that you're making that it's completely not working in that environment. You can't just take a method and apply it to another LARP without thinking it through. And there are tens or possibly hundreds of really useful methods that you can use for calibration and safety in your LARPs. So I'm just going to give a few very short examples so that you have an idea of like the kinds of things that it could be. I'm going to do like three or four. But there are so many more. And I would ask you to be attentive as we play, to think about this uh, in all of the LARPs you play. How is calibration and safety designed in the LARPs that we play here and in the LARPs that we talk about uh, on the stage? And also, you can come talk to me, because I can talk about this for the whole week. <laughs> Uh, one that is very commonly used in Nordic style LARPs uh, is called the cut break rule. And it's a safe word, safe word system that has two levels. If somebody says the word cut, it means everybody who hears the word cut will now pause the, pause the, play, the play. 
and stop acting in character, and they will, they will be themselves, they will be the player, and they will pause the play, and figure out what's going on. Now, of course, if I need to cut, for instance, because I just broke my leg, or you're about to fall down into a very deep hole, then it's good that I say, oh, you're a cut, cut, and then we stop, and, and say, you're about to fall into that hole. Don't do that, so because it would be sad if you died, and then everybody would be like, whoa, let's cover up that hole, and then continue playing. But maybe I cut because this whole thing reminds me of something terrible that happened in my life. And I don't actually want to talk about that, but I also don't want to continue playing. And I might still cut. So the cut rule has an extra rule that says you don't ever get to ask why somebody cut. They will tell you if you need to know. But if you don't need to know, the appropriate response to cut is you stop play. And then you say, are you OK? Would you like to continue? Do you need to talk? And that person can choose to leave, or they can choose to and stay and talk. Maybe, maybe I, as a player, will say, could we like, not play this about bullying? Could we do take this in another direction? And then we can talk about that, and then we can continue to play. That's one way of doing it. Or I can just say, you guys continue. I need to leave. Because uh, it could be something else embarrassing. Like maybe I have, maybe I have diarrhea. I <laughs> really desperately need to go to the bathroom, and I don't want to tell you because I don't know you that well. That could also be the case. But the fun thing, the great thing with the cut rule is that you don't. Nobody gets to ask. No questions asked. It's always okay to cut. By the way, you have to practice this before the LARP starts, so otherwise it'll feel weird doing it. But it it absolutely works. Then there's a second safe word in the same system, which is break. So if somebody says break, it means I'm OK with this level of intensity, but let's not do any more of this. We start to play maybe on bullying themes, and I say break, and ev everybody can be like, uh, maybe we should not play about bullying. Let's take this in another direction. So it's a way to, to communicate between the players without pausing the play. Off-game rule or gestures. Off-game is a word that means out of character or out of play. It comes, goes back to the ye olden role-playing game traditions. Either maybe you can have a rule where if I say, off game, can you remind, what's your character's name again? Because maybe we're playing brothers and I totally should know and now I have to go tell the person what my brother's name is and I don't remember so I need to ask. So I just discreetly say, off game, what's your character's name? That could be a rule. Sometimes there's a hand gesture. When I started LARPing in the 90s, the hand gesture was this. But this isn't very discreet because now everybody can see that we're not, currently we are, we are not in the play. Sometimes it's really useful for everybody to be able to see that. Sometimes you want something discreet. That's an off-game rule. Tapping out. We're playing something very intense, and I want to uh, cut or break. Uh, you can, the tapping out is an alternative system that you would use instead of those, where I just tap you twice like this uh, on your arm. And then we both stop and evaluate. And I have the opportunity to leave in which case it's essentially a cut, except we don't need to talk about it. Or I can stay and we continue, but then it's, it's basically a break, so we continue on the same level, but no more. Okay. Now, what are the design limitations of the tapping out method? Well, for instance, again, it doesn't work if you're going to attack me from behind. That was my genius mistake. It requires each participant to have at least one arm. It requires each partic participant at all times to have at least one arm free, and it requires the thing that needs stopping to be within arm's reach. Because if I, if I tap myself like this, you may or may not understand that I'm meaning to tap out. So depending on the LARP, this might be super appropriate or it might be completely useless. And that's true for all of the safety and calibration tools. It has to fit your design, just like every other design choice that you make when you design anything, including a LARP. All the design has to speak together in one system. Ping pong rule. Checking in casually, are you OK? Here's a person sitting crying on the floor. Are they dying or are they LARPing? Sometimes it's hard to say. So, but you may want to find out, because if I'm worried, A, like they might look like they're really suffering, or B, I might be so worried that I can't actually play. So I go there, and if this game, this uh, um, rule is, is used in your LARP specifically, and everybody knows this, I can say, ping. And the person can be like, pong, and continue crying. It means I'm fine. <laughs> However, if a player has a real crisis or is in shock or something like that, it's possible that they might actually res respond pong even though they're not fine. So for specific types of emergencies, that's not useful. So if, if it's the kind of LARP where you think that somebody could, for instance, be so triggered that they might not even be able to talk, uh, you, or, or that they might go into slight into shock and just 
respond mechanically Pong, if they're very used to this role. It's better to ask another kind of question, like off game, can you describe how, describe how you're feeling that requires them to think and react, for instance. And so sometimes it's appropriate, sometimes it's not. And uh, in Kapo, they had something called the off-game room, which is a specific place that you can go, which is outside of the gameplay, outside of the fiction, where you can have coffee and listen to heavy metal and plan cool scenes with other participants or talk to the organizers or have a hug or whatever you need to do. Chocolate is often available in the off-game room. And this is also a safety and calibration tool. It's a way for me to calibrate my own experience. I'm going to go out and, and rest a little bit, and then I can continue. Sometimes players don't want to pause uh, the LARP or to step out of the situation. And why is that? Well, I've covered some of these. I mentioned some of these before. I'm just going to recap it again. Why would you not want to pause? If I'm feeling like I'm having a terrible experience and I don't, like this whole story is going in a direction that I don't want to engage with at all, why would I not leave? Well, sometimes peer pressure. Maybe, maybe there's a, a culture in, in your LARP community that it's awesome to always, to never pause. That would be very stupid. Don't create that culture. But sometimes, you know, it can happen. Or I imagine that everybody will judge me. That's not, by the way, they're not going to judge you. And if you just quietly go away, they're going to think that you went to the bathroom. Like they don't, or they're not going to think at all. As in real life, quite often people don't think about us all the time, but we think they do. Their expectations, maybe we think it will disturb the others. We're super curious to find out what happens next in the story. Or the, the fictional relationships are so strong that I don't want to let my sister down. Then you have to remind yourself, no, but that's not actually my sister. Like, you know, uh, um, it's better to, to go to the off game room, for instance, and have a cup of coffee and, and have get some perspective and think about this and then come back and be sisters with this person or not. But you have to think about this. Thing, are there things that you can do in your design to make it easier for people to take care of themselves? And some of these are super practical. Is it necessary for the fiction of your LARP that all of the characters are present in all situations? So I think you're going to play, play a LARP where it is necessary for all of the, where it's very difficult for the, for the LARP to handle if one character needs to leave in the middle, middle of the LARP. And I'm sure we, you're going to talk before, before the, that uh, LARP is run about how to handle that if, in case you actually need to leave for some reason. Is it physically possible to leave the venue or the spaces where the LARP is, is being LARPed? Have you practiced all the rules that, that we're meant to remember? If I have a safety, a safety word or a safe word that I don't remember is completely useless to me, or if I'm too shy to use it because I think I'm going to sound stupid, again, completely useless. So we have to practice it in workshop again and again and again, so we feel that's to totally cool. And what is the social cost of pausing the fiction for yourself or others? Now, very often for your LARP, you need methods to, um, to step out of play anyway. You need it for emergencies, because if there's a fire, it's, it's very good if you can say, we're stopping the game because there's a real fire. <laughs> you, you need some tools for this. But there might be a small emergency where you want to stop only a small part of, of your LARP. And that's actually like, then it's good to have a method in place for this. If, you, if there is a method in place for stepping out of play, it allows the players to, to, to calibrate their own play intens intensity. It allows for a game design where players will sometimes go into another place. If for, perhaps you have a black box in your LARP where they can go and play some dream sequences and then return to the main events. That's a valid design, but that's, that only works if they can actually leave and go and do that. Or a player might get ill or they do their, their dog might run away. There are all kinds of things that might happen that require them to leave this LARP and go do something else. And also, sometimes the fiction requires it, because vampires don't actually pee, but human players have to go to the bathroom. So, so also for the fiction, it makes sense that it's possible for people to, to take themselves out of the situation. So if you only design one element into your LARP that allows the, play, that allows the players to take care of themselves, let it be this. Let it be the ability to step out of play somehow, discreetly, without ruining other people's LARP. And this is good for safety, and it's good for calibration, and it's good for the coherence of your fiction. And if you, when you can do many things with one or few rules or tools, then that's elegant design, and that's the best kind of design. Please note, in educational LARPing, which many of you will be working with down the line, especially in schools, students are very often forced to par participate in your LARP. They didn't choose to be there and they can't choose to sit it out. 
is it possible for you to design a LARP where they can still opt out if they don't want the experience of your LARP? And this is very often a design negotiation, but also a negotiation between you and the teacher. Or if the teacher is running the LARP without you even being there, this is extra important to think about. How do you help your participants be safe if they are forced to participate in something? So you can think about these questions during the LARPs you play this week. Did you, when you were playing today, Family Anderson, did you know how to opt out of, of, of the LARP if you wanted to? Were there special methods introduced for how to pause the play if you need to? Was that method workshopped before? And have you already opted out of something today? Have you made the active choice today to not participate in something? I, for instance, chose to sit down during Eric's warm-up exercises because I didn't feel like standing up. And he said, it's okay to sit down. And I was like, I stood up first because I have a sense of duty. And then I was like, no, actually, I don't want to do warm-up exercises. And I sat down again. And then you all did warm-up warm -up exercises, but it was okay because he had given me the alibi to do that. He had given me permission to do that. Okay, last five minutes. Psychological safety is something that you can read about on the internet, and you should listen to zero things that you hear about psychological life safety on the internet. It is all bollocks. There are zero documented cases of LARP causing mental health problems in players. OK, and this is true. However, however, of course, of course, like anything else in life, if people have pre-existing mental health issues, of course, just like that can be triggered by other things, that can also be triggered by LARPs. Then it's not caused by the LARPs, but it might still happen in conjunction with, or at, or as a consequence of a LARP. And that means that suddenly you, as the maker of that LARP, or the organizer of the event where that person is, is involved. And the, the risk of this happening is a lot stronger if the participants haven't been sleeping. Or physical pressure uh, is one of those things that people with mental health issues, like a lot of people in my family, for instance, don't respond well to physical pressure. So you have to be aware that if you decide to use physical pressure as a design tool, you are adding the risks of these kinds of episodes happening at, at uh, or in conjunction with your LARP. Be attentive off game to how people are feeling. Uh, if you have friends who have mental health issues and you know that they're actively ill, you maybe don't let them play LARPs. Uh, maybe that's good advice, but it's good to know that there's very little research on this. And there are also very many positive effects from playing LARPs. So, so actually, it's possible that the possible effects of LARPing are, are, are bigger than the negative uh, effects of LARPing. Nobody really knows. But there is some interesting research done, uh, and if you... Um, if you ask me after, I can point you in some directions. But it's good to remember that just as you wouldn't start operating on somebody who breaks their leg in your, uh, in your LARP, unless you're actually a doctor, like I know we have at least one in the room, uh, you're also not a psychiatrist. So like, let the professionals do that work. But it's good to have a, a plan in place. Just like you'd have a plan for calling an ambulance, it's good to think if there's a mental health emergency at my big event, how do I deal with that? Who do I call in my city? to get help in a situation like that. Often it's an ambulance, by the way, but it's good to have a, a plan for this. LARPs do seem to trigger mental health situations, primarily depression and exhaustion problems in LARP organizers. <laughs> so you are at risk. <laughs> Weirdly. And the reason for this is physical and economic stress because LARP makers, like all other artists, get so passionate about their stuff and then you want to do a big project and it has too little money. So you decide wisely to do this on the side while you're still maintaining a real job and you're not going to sleep for three months and you're going to spend all the money you have and all the money on your credit cards to make your LARP and then your, your, your uh, husband is not going to be super excited about this. And then maybe it doesn't even go very well because you were too tired to run it properly and then you get very depressed and have some mental health issues. This has happened many, many times. So I'm mentioning it, mentioning it here, just to focus on, on where the real uh, challenge is. So just as much as we have to think about keeping our players safe, we have to think about keeping ourselves safe. And I think the most important, here are some things, and you're going to have these slides, but the most important thing is don't be alone. 
ask another person who also makes LARPs, who isn't involved in the making of your specific LARP, to come and be your support person while you're running your event. And then you can go to their event and be their support person, so that there's somebody who says, have you eaten? And now you must sleep. And oh, it's 4 a.m. and you seem to be folding 7,000 pieces of paper. Hmm, let me fold those for you so that you can sleep and that then you can be a human to your players in the morning. These are real examples, by the way. Um, I'm going to spend a last uh, very few minutes, because now I'm, I'm, I only have 30 seconds left on this topic, <laughs> uh, which is community safety. Uh, and, and these are the questions you need to ask yourself. Is LARP known in your environment? Like we're from 17 plus different countries. The participants are from 17 different countries at least. How is LARP understood in your environment? And how are your actions affecting how LARP is understood in your country and in, your wor in the world? Different societies and locations have different, different tolerances for fiction and for play and for LARP. In the United States and Israel, I wouldn't play with toy guns, in, in not even unrealistic looking ones in public spaces, for instance. Uh, we have examples from the Belarus where the authorities are very negative to LARP, and of course in particular to political LARP, uh, where it doesn't pay to advertise necessarily what your hobby is, so that's something to, wor to be worth thinking about. Less than three weeks ago, we had a situation uh, with a Palestinian Finnish LARP that was organized in Finland, where some of the makers, designers of this LARP, and some of the Palestinian players who already had visas were stopped and harassed at the Finnish border because it was unthinkable to the Finnish border police that, that Palestinians could be LARPers. So they thought they were secret refugees trying to get into Finland with the stupidest explanation of all time. But I mean, this is, but this is terribly racist. And the thing is that everything that we do, everything that we do with LARP, that goes on the internet affects all of these communities. You may make a LARP in, in Skövde in Sweden and you think that you're unconnected from the safety of Belarusian LARPers, but that's not true. Like Because of the internet, when it says LARP, we're all affecting each other. So let's be responsible about this medium. And if you have very extreme looking pictures, think twice about putting them online and make sure that everybody who is in the pictures from your LARP really understands what it means to have their name or their and their face searchable on the internet in these images. And quite often, I think like a photo policy is the first thing you should put in place if, if your LARP has any kind of, of um, of intense content. But in the United States, uh, you can get harassed at your job or fired even for just playing in a normal fantasy LARP because it's considered to be that lame. So, I mean, you really do have to think about this uh, as, an, as an organizer to be serious. You might be very proud of LARPing, and you should be, but there are still pockets uh, of, of cultures in the world where that's not the case. All of us in this room, please look around at each other. Yeah, this is also your LARP community. So these at least 17 countries who are represented here, we all belong to each other now, whether we want it or not. <laughs> I mean, we do, but, but, it, but we don't get to make that choice anymore because, because now we've been at the LARP Writer Summer School and we're all gonna be LARP makers at the end of the week. And, and that means that we have a responsibility not just to make the world a better place, which is, I think, a human responsibility, but we have a responsibility to, for public perception and also for all of us in our relationship to, to our families and our resources and, and so on. Now, uh, this talk has historically had a section that's about things that happened before and after the LARP. Uh, I'm just going to run through this, this slide. So you, you will get this, and these are just so that you will have them collected in one place. But because we're going to have separate sessions about workshops and debriefs, uh, I'm not going to go into this very much. But it's good to, to have in mind that the, th the things that happen during the runtime of your LARP are only part of the design. Most of your expectations and the preparation that your, that your players do happens before. So when you start to play a new computer game, for instance, the first thing that happens is that the computer game teaches you how to play that specific computer game, because all computer games are different. LARP is the same. You have to design the process through which your LARPers at your specific next LARP understand how to play that specific next LARP. And that needs to happen before the LARP starts, because then it's too late. Uh, and we're going to talk in other sessions about how that happens. And then, of course, after the LARP is when uh, the players decide uh, 
what happened at this LARP and was it a good experience and how, how did we do this together? And it's good to, again to remember that most of their understanding and most of their opinions about the quality of your LARP will be based on stuff that happened after, just after the playing ended. So you may, might want to design a good process for that so that they will feel that they were taken care of and their reactions were taken care of and their joy and their community that they just created together was also taken care of after the LARP. With long events in the Nordic countries, we often have a party. It's a really good idea. Then everybody can get to, to know each other well also out of character. I'm going to give you one debrief uh, rule. Uh, because there's a whole session about that, but I think this might be useful for you during the week, and I suggest that we that we try to use it as much as we can. It's called the third person rule. So we LARP in the first person. That means that when I'm that queen that I mentioned before, then I'm like, I am the queen, or in the, what does it say? I am President Wonder Horse. I am partner of Super Stallion. And then when we debrief afterwards, when we talk about what happened in the LARP, then we do it in the third person. Instead, I don't say, I did this and I did this when I mean my character, because I am not actually my character. I say, Wonder Horse did this, and then I felt as a player that it would be interesting if Wonder Horse would get more paranoid about Super Stallion, so la la la. I play in first person, I debrief in third person. Yes. So, if you will only remember one thing from this very, very packed uh, hour, let it be this. Players are more important than LARPs. Humans are more important than art. Uh, empower your players to take care of themselves and of each other, and they will be able to create a wonderful LARP together with you. And if you want to read more, uh, firstly, you're, I'm you're all going to get these slides. They're going to be on the LARP Writer Summer School website uh, soon. And if you need them faster, if you need them during this week for any reason, I'm sure we can fix it with a PDF somehow. Uh, good sources for more information about LARP in general is nordiclarp.org. And my blog where I'm writing this book about participation safety that includes like 10 times more information and more happening all the time is participationsafety.wordpress.com. Thank you very much. You have been super patient. Thank you.